Hi, everybody. Uh, I've given several talks this in the past year here. And looking around the room, I'm not sure I have anything new in this that, uh, to tell you. But we'll see, uh, we'll, see what, we'll see what happens. I want to emphasize um, on this one the unfinished uh, agenda of public health in India. It sounded like a lot of the other discussions were on health care. I would like to move us back a, uh, a step. And in fact, I think this is being overly generous. <laughs> Good. Uh, it, it's not the infinite. The, the red, the red cross is supposed to be a little higher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, it, it's really not the unfinished agenda. It's really the barely started agenda of of public health in India. Brian, I'm going to discuss. Uh, it's probably the same amount of money spent in India as in Australia, but you do have a sewer system, do you not? Yeah. Okay. So um, this one I'm pro positive that everyone's seen because I only have two things to say about any policy ever, and I've spoken here before, so I'm sure you've seen this slide before. And this is not just health. This is electricity, uh, this is rural electrification, finance and, uh, and bank regulations, um, uh, roads, education, everything. It's the same two things I have to say. One is provide public goods before private goods. And this is public goods the way an economist would define it. That is, uh, there is no possibility of a private sector because it's excludable and rival, not because you'd like um, uh, government to, uh, to provide it. It's that it actually has to be done by government. So provide those first. And then you might like to augment this with the uh, insight that you should do things you can do before trying those you can't or else are uh, more le le less provocatively, just take constraints on government capabilities um, seriously. Uh, in health, this is kind of a simple argument. This is, this is supposed to have, anyway. Um, some health policies address massive market failures and some don't. There are, in p health, we have real public health, the way things that were handled in, the, uh, in Europe at the late, um, in the latter part of the 19th century, particularly sanitation. And uh, these address genuine public goods and goods with big externalities. Okay. We also have uh, a market failure that we don't, that doesn't get discussed nearly as, uh, as much, I don't think, is that insurance markets fail everywhere. I can't think of a single exception to that. Even in the richest countries, private insurance markets are deeply flawed, which is why most countries, except for the United States, don't rely on them much. Um, and hospital, but in but they're also difficult to manage. And hospitals might be a second best way of dealing with this non-existent health insurance uh, market if governments can't actually um, uh, monitor insurance. The Emphasis in the international health community, however, since 1977, has been primarily on primary health care. And this one, it's unclear exactly what the market uh, failure is. Um, there is some possibility of supplier-induced demand and so on and so forth. These are relatively subtle, though, in comparison to why don't we have a sewer system or uh, wh wh why is there no health insurance. That's step number one. Step number two, some health policies are particularly important for the poor and some aren't. So the kinds of real public health things that were done in the 19th century are basically infectious disease control. These also happen to be the exact same things that are disproportionately um, uh, challenging to poor people in India and in lots of other countries around the world. And while uh, non-communicable diseases are larger, affect more people, uh, the disproportion between poor and rich on infectious disease is very dramatic. So uh, dealing with infectious disease is very much pro-poor. Some health policies are hard to implement. I didn't see uh, Yamani's um, uh, presentation, but I presume she pointed out some of the difficulties in Swatch Bharat. Uh, but some are even harder. Um, and uh, these things should be uh, thought, thought through. So I suggest that policy should be strategic and get the most welfare improvement um, possible relative to what happens without a policy, given both the money and the implementation uh, constraints. 
So maybe it isn't so simple, but that is the, the logic I'd like to follow. Um, so when you have limited budgets, we should really want to go head to head um, on uh, different kinds of policies. Everybody likes to promote their own kind of policy. You realize that whenever you promote your own kind of policy, you're taking money away from somebody else's policy. And, you, and in order to uh, make legitimate comparisons, you should really compare them head to head. The two that I'd like to look at are sanitation and primary health care. Uh, I'm going to zip right through four uh, research studies uh, quickly. Uh, in urban areas, rural areas, um, one study on drainage and open defecation in Delhi slums, um, medical care in, in Delhi, a randomized control trial of Maharashtra total sanitation campaign, and uh, quality of medical care in rural Madhya Pradesh. Um, this, these are studies which are, one of them is old, one of them is new-ish, one of them is borrowed, mostly the uh, Madhya Pradesh study, and one of them has a blue um, um, slide. So we're, we've handled all four. Just for context, this is uh, a, a diagram which shows the log of open, defecate, open defecators per six square kilometer in international comparison. The red uh, circles are Indian states. The green are different countries around the world. Uh, there's nothing subtle about this and there's no real causality. I would like to uh, point out, well I think it is kind of indicative even if, if we can't prove causality. Uh, but we notice that in India, we have gigantic um, problem of open defecation. Uh, the most, in this, this is from the NFHS, so the, mo the average for the country was 60 something percent uh, still open def openly defecating. And in fact, there's a big uh, mystery in the world about why it is India with a much higher level of income per capita ha has such short kids compared to say Africa. Well, those little st the little circles to the upper left are, in fact, African countries. Um, they might have problems with open defecation, but of course they have much more land. So I, uh, while it's not really causal, uh, it is interesting that both the international and the national lines are fairly similar. And over there on the right, which is the small circle, medium-sized circle all the way to the right, is Delhi. Um, so uh, Delhi has many fewer per capita open defecators, but because it's such a compact area, it, is, um, it has some of the highest open defecation rates per square kilometer in the country. And therefore, the density of open defecation suggests we take a, look, a little bit closer look at cities. Um, so I'd like to give you a little a zip through one study of four unrecognized slums in Delhi. Uh, we don't have to go into the background. Uh, this was supposed to be a big study of how come uh, unrecognized slums got services they weren't entitled to. Mine was much easier, which was what does hygiene have to do with health? This is a diagram of NOIDA Section 8. Um, and uh, the, what this shows is the red dots are households in which there was uh, a case of diarrhea in the previous two weeks. The open dots, which may or may not, the ghostly dots, I don't know if you can see them, are households where there were not. And the color, other than blue, is um, the average number of open, open defecators with it. It's a weighted average geographically of open defecators in, in near these different parts of the, of the, of the, of the house, of the neighborhood. Uh, and basically, I wanted to correlate um, uh, incidents of, or how many open defecators are near you uh, with a diarrheal disease. This is some descriptive skills. Forget all this. What I'd like to show you is on the, bo the bottom few rows, we have uh, water enters the home sometime during the year. And in Noida 8, it's 55% of people in the sample had water coming into the house at some time during the year. Obviously, it was in uh, the monsoon season. And, we, um, and if you know any of these neighborhoods, you realize that in front of the house, there is a ditch that sometimes has open sewage. So when the water that comes into your house is just washing over this open sewage onto the floor of the living um, uh, conditions, it is not a rare event. It's rare in Punjabi Basti, because of much higher income, but it's actually quite large in uh, various neighborhoods. I don't think Kaputli Colony exists anymore, but um, it did for the case of the study. Also, open defecation in cities is rare, but not that rare. Um, and in fact, uh, it's still something that we need to uh, worry about. And the bottom wasn't, isn't showing. 
when we do some simple stuff um, uh, and look at diarrhea in a two-week period with some other stuff on the right-hand side of a regression equation, so we, we know this is just correlation, we see that if we have uh, three kinds of problems. One is water comes into your house. That's what water means. One is people, someone in your house uh, practices open defecation. Remember, total sanitation campaign and, and uh, Swatch Bar are supposed to get defecation free. So anybody in the household is something of a, of a, um, of a risk. And finally, does someone in the neighborhood uh, or in, within two and a half meters of your house um, uh, ha practice open defecation somewhere? We don't know where this is. Just comparing the extreme left and extreme right, we see that even in, when everything is going well, when, there's, when there is drainage, when people are, in fact, uh, using latrines, uh, we, still have inf uh, we still have diarrhea incidents for, ch for infants quite high. That's 14% in a two-week period. And if all of these things are bad, bad water, open defecation, neighbors open, openly defecating as well to get at the externality. We see that that comes to 7.8 episodes per year, 30% in a two-week two period. That certainly is enough to kill you. So we see that there's a big problem with uh, uh, sanitation problems in Delhi. We're spending a fair amount of money on um, uh, primary health care. This is before the Mohalla clinics. We'll have to come back to that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that we might have some doubt as to why publicly provided health care may not work. Uh, so, the only thing I can tell you from this is you see that tri red triangle over on the left side? That is the amount of effort that a public primary health care doctor puts into, a, into a, um, a, a contact with a patient in poor neighborhoods in Delhi. It's impossible from this to, it's way, this is three standard deviations to the left. This is because the average number of uh, questions asked of a patient in a public primary health care center in 2001 uh, um, uh, was one. Kya hai? Um, uh, it's what is it? <laughs> yeah, uh, a little bit ruder than what's up, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, a, in any case, uh, and I'm telling you, the average is one. You know, some people said some people might have asked two questions, which means that there must be substantial people who are writing prescriptions as the patient is walking in the door, which is something that we know. It's very difficult to see exactly what that is going to do for our patients uh, uh, compared to like putting in a sewer system. Okay, what about rural areas? I, I present this. I presented this for some from time now, and people would say, "Oh, surely sanitation isn't important in the rural areas, or surely there's no access to medical care and public medical care is absolutely necessary in rural areas." Well, I think surely somebody should measure something before uh, asserting these things so very confidently. Um, so this is a study of the total sanitation campaign. What it really was is a collaboration between the World Bank, this is when I worked at the World Bank, and the government of Maharashtra to evaluate the sanitation intervention with a randomized control trial. Uh, students of mine, this is the one and only time I did a randomized control trial, and I don't usually like to rely on them, but since they were going to do the study anyway, it might as well be randomized. Uh, um, the intervention was a village level education effort done by the government as opposed to some clever little nudge that someone comes up with uh, to change behavior. It's not just to build the trains but to get people to use them and it was supposed to be uh, people from the Department of Rural Development to figure out what the best way to get across the idea that open defecation is a bad idea village by village and use that as a, um, as a means to trying to change behavior. Uh, then there were uh, midline and, uh, and follow-up. And it was supposed to be in three districts, Amanagar, Nanda, and Nanderbar. Uh, they're relatively poor districts. And in fact, the, uh, the Secretary of Rural Development, Mr. Katwa, was uh, 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 very ambitious. He said, you know, if it's going to work in these places, it'll work anywhere. 
Nandarbar is an incredibly tribal, very heavily tribal area. These are tough places to, to work. So, and he didn't want to make things easy on himself. He wanted to go for the hardest, very courageous. On the other end, it didn't really work. Um, the, uh, the surveys were done. That is, I did my job. Uh, but only Amindagar actually, um, uh, Amindagar, uh, got the intervention. The officials couldn't act, wouldn't actually go to the tougher areas to implement the uh, intervention. So when we talk about replicating, scaling up, uh, proof of concept, blah, 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 we have to sort of take into account, will this policy actually be uh, implemented? Um, uh, something that we take for granted way more than we should. But it, uh, so did it work a bit? I'm getting there. <laughs> Well, one of the uh, reasons why we're concerned about uh, behavior changes, this is from the baseline survey, uh, latrine ownership is not the same thing as usage of latrines. I guess we all knew that, though we might come back to the question of what's being measured in the Swatch Bharat campaign. Uh, but we see that uh, even in these areas, uh, Nandarbar, for example, is most, uh, most uh, extreme, that over 30% of the people who use, who have latrines, don't use them. This is not too surprising. These are a lot of these people are farmers, and men aren't going to come back to the to, to the house in the middle of the day. Uh, but it, again, uh, we have to measure what's actually important and not what's easily uh, observed. And ownership of latrines are easily observed. What they actually do with them is not, uh, and it's not the same thing. Okay, okay this isn't going to work either. Yeah, this isn't working either. All right, I'll tell you whether it worked. <laughs> uh, yes, in, the, in Amandagar, where they actually implemented the, um, uh, the campaign, we have, in fact, in the literature, it's like three and a half standard deviations from the height for age um, measurement uh, uh, between, between the uh, uh, baseline and the end line, and something intermediate for the midline, which makes you a little bit more confident this might, have, might be true. Uh, they, oh, they actually did um, a build of trains, and at least from the uh, survey data, it is that they were using them much more regularly uh, than they had been before, and much more regularly than either the the baseline or the end line in the two districts that they couldn't get to. So uh, it's both. It's a, actually it's a triple difference. It's a uh, before and after, with and without, in in uh, places that it was intended and, and not. Um, so, but but the. Um, when this is reviewed by some epidemiologists, they say, oh, no, the point estimate is way too high. Like three or four th tenths of a standard deviation is way high in the, in the nutritional literature on uh, height for age. Of course, uh, they didn't look at the standard errors, which are also reasonably high, it's significantly different from zero, but not necessarily from any uh, more reasonable number, not at all different from any more reasonable number. So but it is, in fact, a very clear effect. So was the state capacity very good, or, you know, because state capacity is this an essential part of whether it will, well, and yes, intervention will work or not. That's exactly the point. It, it, no, it wasn't. They only got to, they would only do it in two of the three, in one of the three uh, uh, districts. So no, the capacity was not nearly good enough to, uh, to specify this for a, a national program. It, in fact, it's promising because it works, but only where it works. Uh, where, and that is where it gets implemented. Um, there were limitations of getting staff uh, to go and to put conscientious effort into the difficult areas. Figuring out what message you would give to tribal people in Nandarbar was not something that they uh, even attempted, let alone uh, followed through on. And so we should not overestimate government's, abil government's ability to implement this everywhere. Now, I think what we should be looking at in the next few months, years, when uh, the government uh, reports at how well Swatch Bharat is doing, um, it says that it's eliminating open defecation, but basically it's only measuring latrine construction, which is exactly the same problem that we had in the Central Rural Sanitation Program from the mid 80s, where um, uh, you can go through, this is Maharashtra, you go through almost any village, you will see uh, uh, the superstructure of latrines that were built in the mid 80s uh, that are being used in many very interesting and creative ways, mostly to, to store uh, farm implements and, and fertilizer. But in many of these, which are very, very poor uh, villages, these are 
Pukka buildings. They're the, by far the best building in the, in, the, um, in the village. Most people are living in mud and wattle uh, huts. And so they figured, well, it's useless to put, use this for a latrine. Many of them were built without a hole in them. Um, and therefore, we should dedicate it to the gods, and they become puja rooms. So I, want, I like to be able to say, this is a great thing to do. But from our evidence, it's a really great thing to do if you can actually get it implemented. But it is not so easy to just say it will automatically be implemented. What about publicly provided primary health care? Well, this doesn't seem to work at all. Uh, so this is a very old data, which uh, 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 I, would, I was going to have this whole thing about uh, how we should focus on better data. Uh, why is this so old? Is because even the, 19, the 2005 NFHS didn't have enough information on whether or not there was a public facility in, in the village. So we don't know. So, this is, so it's almost 20 years. We still don't know whether this stuff works. But it didn't, that didn't keep us from uh, spending a lot more money. Uh, what this is a, is a distribution of T statistics. It fuzz up your eyes. It looks like a distribution, a normal distribution, a little bit lopsided, but almost a normal distribution, uh, with exactly as many significant right sign and wrong sign uh, results from, these T from the T statistics or whether or not uh, having a facility in your village affected uh, mortality. Um, so it seems to me that this is a distribution pretty much centered on zero. And why would this be? Well, this is a whole bunch of things. There's, what does someone see when they go to a public primary health care center? Well, there's a lot of vacancies. That's a, that's a financing problem. There's a lot of absenteeism. There's a lot of low capability of medical providers, meaning that when you give them vignettes, hypothetical uh, problems, they can't get the right answer. Um, there's abysmal effort of medical providers that's reflected in the, uh, the, the one minute average uh, visit from, from, uh, by public primary health care providers. And there are many substitute providers. This is just, uh, there's just, this is, so the public sector is just one actor in a gigantic mass of private providers. So there's going to be substitution where if the public provider it, it, uh, opens up, a lot of that is just taking away business from private providers. Uh, and just to show you, this is from Eastern Madhya Pradesh. This is the Bara part. This is uh, Jishnu Das, who I've done a lot of work with and who Jorge and I have done uh, work with at the World Bank. This is from Eastern Madhya Pradesh, and this is a uh, this is the the red dots are households in the, to the to the lower left. The actual market for those people, uh, that straight line from the bunch of red lines, at the bunch of households at the bottom to the village, is a road uh, in which most people see, seek care in the in the um, the larger village a little bit a little farther away. And this is full of people. There's some public providers. That's the blue dots. I don't know whether you can see those. There are not too many of those. There's the private MBBS doctors. There's a yellow tax, a few of those. There's homeopaths. In fact, including electro homeopaths. I don't know what that is, but uh, uh, there seem to be a few of those. Uh, Ayurvedic and Unani providers. And the white um, uh, tax are people with no qualification or degree whatsoever, uh, otherwise known as quacks. Um, and that a person can go to a lot of these things. So when we say that there's that 80% of primary health visits are to the private sector, it's to a whole mass of people who they prefer to a free public clinic, including the quacks. And you could say, aha, you just told us that a lot of these people are quacks. So surely there's a problem of access to high quality real doctors in the public sector. I'm really getting tired of people who are so sure about these things. So let's measure that. Fine. I'll tell you what was here. <laughs> um, what, what was on this slide was uh, how many people, in, in dealing with asthma in Madhya Pradesh with standardized patients, this was how many people were uh, given the right uh, a diagnosis whatsoever. That was very small, smallest in the public primary health care center. They're not even telling people what they got. And then pr provided that they gave the right uh, a diagnosis, how many of them were right, and there was no difference between the public primary health care center and the quacks. And uh, when it gets to actual treatment, um, uh, uh, we had two things. One is quacks actually did slightly better on giving um, um, steroids, which is one of the things they could, they're supposed to do. And uh, one of the things that the private sector is, is pounded on is for overuse of antibiotics. But in fact, 
Yeah, you can't see this. The, uh, the public, private, qualified, unqualified was 0 0.31, 0 0.32, 0 0.33, 0 0.31. There was no difference whatsoever between the quacks and the public primary uh, health providers, which have MBBSs. You're wondering exactly how, why, they, why we spent, bothered to give them a medical degree. Um, so let's look at the market and the government failures whenever we, take in, whenever we examine these things. On the one hand, we have the real uh, 19th century public goods, and it doesn't matter how bad government is at doing this, there's no choice. Uh, it, it, common sense for cities is, yeah, maybe a city of 20 million people, 26 million people should have a sewer system. And uh, some evidence that um, uh, such things could work in rural areas, I'm not so sure. Um, and primary care has, we're not so sure what market failures is going on, and the government has a really hard time providing it. But the directives from the WHO and for the high level expert group promoting primary health care for all should not be taken on faith. And so far, it's entirely on faith. Ah, the NRHM meeting. Yeah, okay. Uh, in the summer of 2013, I was, uh, happened to be working at uh, Delhi School of Economics and my colleague said, oh, there's gonna be this big celebration of the success of, natural, of the National Rural Health Mission. Wouldn't you be, like to see that? I said, yeah, I'd sure like to see that. Um, and uh, there, was represent, there was the Secretary of Health, uh, the government of India, the, the person in the planning commission who worked on health, a couple other speakers, and they said, uh, this was a great success. National Rural Health Mission was a great success, and in fact, it led to the, uh, in, it was the inspiration for expanding it to the National Health Mission, right? Okay, what was their evidence? This was very interesting, because when I was living here in 2005, I said, shouldn't there be a baseline, or somebody should measure something about health before we put in this gigantic program? Yeah, fine. So their evidence for whether the, why this was such a big success was, A, we spent more money. B, we hired more workers. And the third one was, and we increased capacity of the state governments. State subject, that's a really good thing. What did they mean by increasing the capacity of state governments? We got them to spend more money and hire more workers. So in fact, there wasn't one word about one child's life being saved from this gigantic program, and they had no evidence whatsoever to back up the claim. So I can't help but uh, second your opinions uh, entirely. Uh, this is basically it. I think I have, oh, oh, oh this is good. <laughs> so when you do this weighing, uh, you, exactly what you're getting at, Eli, the right comparison is the way po policy is actually implemented, or if you think you can fix it, you have to give concrete uh, steps for how it can practically be improved. You can't just wish away the problem and uh, have a comparison with policies as you wish they could be implemented. It should be with how they actually are implemented or with some real good belief that you can get it um, fixed. So far we don't do anything except uh, uh, assume that when we provide a doctor, he'll show up for work and do what he's supposed to do. Uh, this was all stuff which was going to be uh, on data. I think we should have uh, a rolling panel of data f at a very small level, possibly Grand Panchaya, district would be all right, um, and be able to integrate um, uh, data from a bunch of different sources, including rural development and, in this particular case, NASA data. That's the U.S. National, uh, U.S. Uh, Space Agency. This is November 2016 now and the sky is a little bit uh, hazy. Well, what this is is a uh, picture of agricultural fires uh, as seen from space. And if you, that big red block is, of course, Punjab, state in, in, in India. Um, and, it, and as a matter of fact, a, a, a group of students who I brought here in 2013, the policy workshop students, uh, found, uh, uh, looked at this picture and found that for the Punjab, which is a rich state and most things are much better there, health status is generally much better there, except for one thing which was respiratory illness, uh, where for reasons that were otherwise completely inexplicable, respiratory illness was worse in the Punjab, controlling for income and all the other stuff. This might actually be a reason for that, but we would never know this unless somebody was keeping track. So that's all I have to say.